Sutter also regards the ether as a gas and succeeds to produce these ultrafine high speed particles in his vacuum tubes. And I duplicated this in the experiment. He claims velocity is 15 times that of light. Tesla's tubes gave the ether the properties of mechanical force against ponderable matter. I'll describe an experiment I did where I took these special Tesla type of currents that we'll get into later and why they're different and energized light bulbs with them. Well, light bulbs don't light up like normal on this because this is not normal electricity. So this kind of a solar system or galaxy starts to appear inside the bulb with little suns and comets and stars and, and gradually it becomes cumulative like these power line oscillations. And what happens in this process is that actually even though that the bulb has a vacuum, a partial vacuum in it, is the glass when heated starts to push out Something is pushing the glass out. So what has been done is the ether now has been solidified in the I disregarded the existence of the ether as a reality, but changed horses when the concept of the ether was eliminated by the Einstein concept of distorted measurement of what is called relativity. It's a natural philosopher by the name of Lamour at this point says, we should not be tempted towards a simple group of relations, such as Maxwell had tried to create, which have been found to define the activity of the ether by treating them as mechanical of concealed structure in that medium. We should rather rest satisfied with having attained their exact dynamical relations and not be into describing a physical, because they're not physical. Okay. Now, it looks like I went out of material here for some reason. Okay, on the sheet. Okay, that's it. So I think we need to start going through these. It was very difficult to get all this together in time, and most of it got like lost or shuffled or this this uh, talk came hot out of the oven. So let's go through here, and then I'll start talking about. Okay, now we're going to get into a more practical situation. So here we have a long distance telephone line, a basic, uh, simple reality. We're going to focus in on that. So we're going to look a little closer. I'm doing uh, measurements on it with my car. You can't see the antennas. I think you can kind of see them up in the front. They're about 10 feet high. The car has equipment that can give the ability to sense the way insects do with their antennas through the electrostatic field. That special equipment inside the car right now determining what kind of forces are around various power lines and rocks and those type of things. It's part of my research. OK, we'll take another shot. Okay, now we're into each individual transmission pair. Okay, we'll focus in tighter. So this is what we're dealing with. Okay, now we're going to go to a, a graphical, this is what we have. There's the two wires. Okay, and we have an impulse started at the end again, going to the receiving end of the wires, and then the diagrams are the conversions of the ether in the space between the wires into what are called electrical constants of inductance and capacitance and resistance and conductance. And then the field diagram between those two wires, if we go back to the two wires, if we go back to the field diagram, field diagram, no, back to the field, oh. back to the field diagram. Okay, now those are the two wires cut sideways and these are the two wires going end to end. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, now we're going to start to take this space apart between the wires. So we're going to start with the quantity of total electrification, which we're going to call the plank. Okay, and this quantity is going to be considered undivided. That's the basic electricity between the wires. Okay, and this consists of two parts. One is called the total magnetization in Weber's. And that's the Greek letter phi. And the Greek letter psi is the total dielectrification between the wires in Coulomb. So let's go back to the space between the wires so we can show where these things exist. There you go. It's fun games with it, like all this technology does. You just have to hold it, okay? So this here in this diagram is the dielectrification. And we're symbolizing the totality of the dielectrification, which is the total number of lines of force in our system which is the span between two utility poles, okay, with the Greek letter psi. The magnetic forces, which form the circumferential circles, we're taking the total quantity of that between the two poles, and we're going to call that the Greek letter phi. 
And then the point at which these unite, the net sum of all those we're going to call Q, or the total electrification of the system. So let's go back to our, our equations. So we have the total electrification, and then we have the magnetization and the dielectrification, and these are named after Planck, Weber, and Coulomb. So let's look at them. There's Max Planck. These are all very famous people. A lot of you don't even hear about. Let's go to Weber. These are the guys that basically created our technology of today. And then Coulomb. Okay, let's go to the next. Now we're going to start to, to get this stuff broken down. So we'll get our basic relationships. So if we take the ratio of the total electrification to the total dielectrification, then that gives us the magnetism in Weber's. If we take the total electrification, the ratio of that to the total magnetization, then obviously that gives us the total dielectrification. And the electrification is the unqualified product of magnetism and dielectricity. In other words, these are the two aspects of dielectricity. This is the outer space aspect of dielectricity, and this is the inner space aspect of dielectricity. Okay, let's go on. That x there, that's the cross product, not the That means it's multiplication. Not the cross product. But not the product, generalized, not, not, not qualified multiplication to any type of product. If I were to take a macro view of this, would I be looking from this interpretation as you speak of this a little sorry, if I, sorry, that was a little problem. If I were to take a macro view of this concept, because that's how I see this, um, I'd be looking at density patterns in the ether. Is that kind of what you're interpreting? Exactly. Okay, so then you have like like flux <coughs> patterns. Right. There's a waveform actually fluctuating through this ether. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, that's where I'm developing these ideas now. So. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Now, okay. now normally somebody mentioned, somebody the mentioned the cross products, so let's go back. Let's that's, go back to me. What, that's centimeters to the fourth there. I just want to make sure I understand that. Uh, go back to where you were a second ago. On the bottom uh, on the right. We're not, we're not using that yet. Bottom on the right. I know, we haven't got there yet. Let's keep going back. <coughs> we have to retrace our steps because some people are asking questions not to define. Okay, go back to the diagram. Go back to the diagram. Okay, now this is a, what's called an electromagnetic configuration, but not, as we'll see later, not all configurations are electromagnetic. Now in this case, this is the cross product. But as we'll find later, the multiplication is more general than that. That's basically the, crux, the whole crux of this talk, is to come up with the non-electromagnetic, or what we would call the Tesla component. So let's keep going then. Okay, now, okay, so this is basically, we're basically just saying here that magnetism and dielectricity are the two components of electricity. Yeah. So I've eliminated the use of the word electric field because it's not correct. We call it the dielectric field in Faraday's terminology. Everybody has agreed upon the magnetic. In Steinmetz's electrical theory, electricity has to be the product of these two quantities. If it is not, if it's just one or the other, it's not electricity. So a charged capacitor is not electricity. Okay, a trapped uh, magnetic field in a motor winding is not electricity. It's only when these two things cooperate interdimensionally with the relationship where the energy of one is exchanged into the energy of the other through a cyclic process do we have the appearance of electricity. Okay, let's go on. Okay, so now when we start to deal with this stuff in space, we start to get into some uh, complexities, and that's what I'm trying to present here. So we, we take the magnetic, the total magnetic densities, okay, and on a per area basis. In other words, we have lines per square centimeter. We call this, let's call this the density of magnetic induction, which would be in Weber's per centimeter square, in other words, square centimeters. Okay, well, obviously we can do the same thing for the dielectric condition. So if we have a cube sitting in there in between the wires, there's going to be a certain number of lines of force going through this one square centimeter clear plastic cube that the wire, that the, the waves just go right through. The wires are just the boundary. The electricity is flowing in this dielectric between the wires. This was Maxwell's profound discovery that electricity does not flow in conductors. In fact, actually, in the days of Franklin, metals were called non-electrics because they destroyed the electric field. The complete opposite conception of what's been put in our minds today. 
Okay, we have an interesting situation. Now, if we try to take this back to the electrification, we have area squared, and this is going to pop up again and again, is now we have the dimensions of space to the fourth power, which a physicist would be uh, tempted to call four-dimensional space, but we're going to modify that concept because that leads errors into the, uh, the uh, mind state. So we're going to work around that, and I'll get into that a little later. So basically, these are just our basic uh, tenets of, of what's to follow. What I'm trying to do is so that everybody knows what these terms that we bandy about are, like volts, amps, ohms, watts, coulombs. Everybody uses these words in electricity, but nobody really knows what their definition is. I could ask everybody in this room what a volt is, and I would get a different answer, and chances are almost everyone would be wrong. But we're going to learn what a volt is. So let's move on. Okay, so if we take the quantity of electrification and we vary that with respect to time, in other words, it gets stronger or weaker or moves somehow so that in time its quantity changes, we call that work or energy in joules. So in other words, energy does not have a primary existence in this electrical theory. Energy is actually a derivative. So we have all of our derivatives of electric fields here. So if we have the magnetism, the total magnetization, and we vary that with respect to time by strengthening or weakening the magnetic field, that gives us E, electromotive force in volts. So that when someone asks you what a volt is, a volt is the rate at which magnetism is produced or consumed in an electrical system. That is the definition of a volt. Okay, now, if we take the total quantity of dielectrification, okay, and vary that with respect to time, in other words, we either produce or consume a dielectric field, and it changes with respect to time, we call that I. And that's called the magnetic force in amperes. Okay, now if we take the quantity of electricity and vary it to the time squared, or if we take the product of these two, which gives us this, in other words, this times this gives us this. We call that power P, or activity. P is the power activity in watts. So then we'll look at the people whose names we're using. So there's Joule, Volta, Amper, and Watt. These are the people that can see these ideas that we're talking about now. Okay, we'll go on to the next. Uh, okay, now we're going to just bring it into the proportionality of the, of the situation. So if we have a magnetic field and we have a current which is associated with it, we take the proportionality between the two, that gives us L, or what we call the magnetic inductance. And that's given in Henry's. So the inductance of an electrical system is the magnetism compared to how much current is required to produce it. So if I can produce 100 units of magnetism for one unit of current compared to one unit of magnetism for one unit of current, the 100 units of magnetism for one unit of current, we have 100 times the inductance of the other situation. So it's a basic proportionality. Now the same thing exists with the dielectric field. If there's a dielectric field, and there's a voltage, or in this case a potential, associated with it, then for every quantity of dielectric field, there has to be a certain amount of electromotive force that gives rise to that dielectric field. And we call this proportionality C, or the dielectric capacity, <coughs> in farads. So we have Henry's and farads. This is called inductance, and this is called capacitance. These are all things I think a lot of people have heard about, but never really got a definition of what they meant. These are basically geometric proportions determined by the configuration of the so-called conductors and insulators and do not change with the actual quantity involved. It's merely the proportionalities of the quantities and their inner workings. Now, if we take the ratio of the electromotive force to the magnetic force or current, we call that Z, or impedance, and this is given in ohms. And conversely, if we look at it from the dielectric point of view, if we take the magnetic force or current and take the proportionality of that to the amount of voltage or EMF or potential of the system, that gives us Y, which is called the admittance 
This was a word developed by Steinbeck. This was a word developed by Heaviside to describe these things. And that's given, and it's a word called Siemens. And then we'll look at the people that are attributed to the development of this. Henry was an American, by the way. He was called the American Faraday. But he being an American, the British made sure that he was kind of left out of the story, so you don't hear about his experiments. But without him, Morse couldn't have developed the telegraph. Because Morse was a painter and an artist. He was not an electrical engineer, and he needed Henry to wind all of his coils. OK, and we have Faraday. Faraday is basically the granddaddy of all of this. They call him the Columbus of electricity. It was his experiments that started the electrical age. He used no mathematics. It was all done with pieces of wood and bottles and things like that. No big giant or more labs, none of these things. Yet his work stands to this day. OK, we'll go on. Then Ohm, he was the one that found the proportions between these constants that we saw earlier, like the, the amount of electricity to the amount of magnetism or the amount of volts to amps. They didn't have a lot of these words back then. Made it hard for the work on. There was no volt or amp for Ohm. But he, Ohm was the one that worked these relationships and produced them for the first time. Then we go to Siemens. Siemens was a, a successfully created one of the world's first long-distance telegraph lines that went all the way from Russia to India. And massive quantities of scientific information were gleaned out of this. And this is basically what started Oliver Heaviside, because he was the first mathematician to analyze the telegraph and telephone line, which created our modern engineering mathematics. Okay, let's keep going. OK, now we have a situation that's a little different. These are where our energy anomalies occur, is in these type of conditions. OK, if we have the inductance of a system, and we vary that with respect to time, in other words, if I have an electromagnet, and the core is moving, so that the, like in a motor, so that the inductance is varying with respect to time, we call that R or resistance. Okay, which can be either given in Henry's per second, but customarily we call that an ohm because it's in the same dimensions as impedance. And then conversely, if we vary the capacitance with respect to time, we call that G or conductance, which in America they use ohm's name backwards or mo, which is inconvenient, so I stuck with the Siemens because that letter S is actually needed later down the line. If it turns out to be in a generalized electrical system, this component represents the destruction of energy, and this component represents the creation of energy in an electrical system. Whether it either be synthesized, or it converts from electricity to mechanical, or it converts from mechanical to electricity, then these are the ways that it goes back and forth. So your light bulbs, your space heaters, your motors, your computers, all that type of stuff involve these relationships. So that the electricity can find its way out of the system and appear as heat or light or in some cases be dimensionally materialized and disappear completely from the system, which does happen. OK, and if we take the product of these two terms, they give us the dimensions of time squared. So if we take the square root of the inductance times the capacitance, that is how we derive what's called the frequency of oscillation. In other words, it has to be a time rate of energy exchange between the magnetic and dielectric field as a constantly dump from one into the other. We're going to get into the mechanism of that a little further down the line here. OK, we'll go to the next. OK, this is actually for a dimensional situation. We couldn't get that in the right spot, so we'll have to go back to it. Well, why are you doing that? What's that? Why are you doing that? It, exactly. seems, to, it seems to me that what you're proposing is sort of like, in a sense, an antenna that can capture these fluctuations in the ether as a way of harvesting this other energy. Is that one way of looking at that? Uh, that might be like an extrapolation of it. But basically, what, my, what, what I have determined in my research and with this mathematics <coughs> and experiments and other people's work is that energy can be taken apart or put back together. Already there. So if you have this potential for somehow capturing these fluctuation or density patterns in the ether, that in itself might be instigating but it looks like a pair of electricity. In the right. Well, okay. if you take a situation, okay, we're standing right now what appears to be uh, motionless space, right? Nothing's moving except for our basic, uh, you know, milling about. But the thing is, is the Earth revolves on its axis, right. so we're moving in a certain direction at 1,000 miles per hour. But then the Earth goes around the Sun, right. 
Okay? So if Earth is going around the Sun, now we're up to about 60,000 miles an hour. That's how fast we're moving through space right now. Now, if we take how fast is the Sun moving through the galaxies, okay, these numbers just keep on building up. Now, let's say we view this as a railroad train. Okay, now if I'm on this railroad train going at 250,000 miles per hour, okay, and I take this thing and I throw it off the train, what's it going to do? It's going to make a big blast, right, when it hits the ground. If this thing is moving at 250,000 miles through space and it stops against the wall, there's no gun that shoots that fast. That is how much energy we have right now in our bodies flying through space. So when Einstein talked about frame drag, he actually talked about the elasticity of the tiny space continuum being you know, manipulated or stretched by a written all body or by other forms of mass. So in a way, in a way, you're kind of poking at that idea. <laughs> well, I'm coming about from a way where it's, it's actually on physical dimensions and not with the metrical dimensions. I'm going to get into that later. That's what those other guys. Let's, actually, let's go back to those diagrams. Okay, I was going to get a little coverage on the dimensions here, because this is part of where the mind virus appears here. It really has to be corrected. So let me, um, let me try to read from this. It is, the computer hated this whole talk and just fought it the whole way. So, so it's I, I, I have determined, so I don't normally use that technology because it's repulsive to me. But I have determined what the, the, the creators of this technology are doing for introducing what we call NEMS, nemesis, into the systems. Okay? And, and when I look at it, the people that create this technology are a bunch of geeks. And what it is is they're creating their geekdom in the machine. And the geekdom feeds on your tension for what you're doing that doesn't fit into what these people like to hear. A friend of mine referred to it as a Trojan horse. I won't say any more about it because that's exactly what it is. So everything you can pretty much see here uh, I, I have been involved in this about 20 years, but just about all this I put together on park benches as a homeless person here in San Francisco for 10 years. I didn't need any computers. It's quicker not to use the computer. You use paste, you use paper, and scissors, and a photocopy machine. <laughs> so, okay. So let's go back to this. Okay, so we're going to start, we're going to deal with the concept of dimensions, because this is something that's going to be cleared up before we go back to the ether. Okay, the definition of dimension. One of a group of properties whose number is necessary and sufficient to determine uniquely each element of a system of entities. That's kind of a choke of a definition. Now, the misuse of the word dimensions is where it's not the case. We're not using dimensions in this term. Okay? Dimensions are not to be defined or expressed as a directional measurement or a number of coordinates, such as a three-dimensional space. There's only one dimension of space. Hereby, space is a solitary dimension, that there exists only the dimension of space, space. Expressions like four-dimensional space-time or two-dimensional space have no meaning. Space-time, then, is simply the relation of two distinct dimensions, the single dimension of space and the single dimension of time. As an example, velocity is expressed as the ratio of the dimension of space to the dimension of time. That is, how many miles of space for or over how many hours of time? Miles per hour. Thus, velocity is expressed as a two-dimensional relationship. Now, if we take the dimensions of time, okay, we have two expressions of time in electricity. We're not, electricity, we're not confined to our normal, uh, so-called rational ideas of what space or time is. Space or time are basically measurement processes. They're not physical processes. So time can either move in a forward direction or it can move in a backwards direction. And the, in an electrical system, any Generalized electric wave consists of a superposition of a wave going forwards in time and a wave going backwards in time. And the point in time which they cross is the crest of the wave. Okay? In the dimension of time, we move in an additive or a subtractive manner. In other words, our operator is plus one or minus one, and time is multiplied by this operator. So time is either plus or minus. Space is entirely different, and this is where the problems start to appear in electrical research. 
Okay? Space, in this case the letter L for length, is now the operator exists in the exponent. So we have outer space, or we have inner space. So it's plus and minus in either, it's in an outside space, like the space of real estate in acres, or it could be an inner space, such as in between the molecules and electrons inside a transistor. So inside the transistor, we have a condition of inner space, or what Rudolf Steiner called counter space. That's the term that I use for this, it's called counter space. There's space and counter space. But in order to make it a truly a duality, we call one outer space, which would be the space outside the wires, and then we have the inner space, which would be the space inside the wires, and we have the exact same condition in the ether. Okay, if I take space, I can take space such as, I can represent that blackboard by a certain number of square centimeters, and that is in the dimensions of outer or space. But if I take a ruler, and I look at the space in between the lines, I call that inner space or counter space. So space is measured in centimeters, in this case, in other words, it's uh, to the positive exponent, but counter space is measured in per centimeters, in other words, to the negative exponent. So this is a very important consideration. Now there's, we go to the next one. There's two systems of logarithms that are in general use. The upper system of logarithms, which gives us our normal uh, trigonometric functions of sines and cosines, and also can give us our hyperbolic sines and hyperbolic cosines. And it's based on a Newtonian uh, mathematical operation where you go through this process and that is the way you express your so-called trigonometric relationships. It makes the equations work. In other words, I can have two pi radians and that tells me that that's one circle. But it has to be in this basic mathematical form. But there's another one that's called the golden ratio. Now what's interesting about the golden ratio, that is this particular expression. Now in the golden ratio, we find that if we have the golden ratio, which is say the letter A, just to represent that specific ratio as a quantity A, if I subtract it from one, I get the same answer as if I take that A and I raise it to the negative one power. So if we go back, the golden ratio, ultimately, this is one of my projects I'm working on now that I have no more equipment. I don't even get involved in mathematics. <coughs> we come up with a system of logarithms that utilizes the golden ratio to attempt to bring these two dimensional representations together. Now, what Steinmetz did in his study of power lines is in order to eliminate having to use these multiple differential equations to go from space to time and express space time, what he did is he measured the length of all the power lines in light seconds. And by making his measurements in light seconds, instead of meters or centimeters or cycles per second or these things, what happened is, is then all of a sudden, these two dimensional relationships unified, and Steinmetz was able to, to calculate and visualize and explain electric waves traveling in these phone lines and power lines that no one had even knew existed. Most of this stuff will not even appear on the voltmeters in a lot of systems, and so there's no way to measure it, because they're existing in these various time frames, going backwards and forwards in spaces. And Steinmetz came up with a much more advanced theory of electricity that, unfortunately, was never allowed to complete. But you see, he started on it, and it's something to work with. So let's keep going here. Then. What do we leave off? OK, we're going, now we're going to go into this actual capacitance and inductance. So the phenomenon of capacitance is a type of electrical energy storage in the form of a field in an enclosed space. This is what we've already seen in our ether diagrams. This space is typically bounded by two parallel metallic plates or two metallic foils on an intervening insulator or dielectric. A nearly infinite variety of more complex structures can exhibit capacity as long as there is a difference in electric potential, or electric potential exists between various areas of the structure. The oscillating coil, or Tesla coil, we refer to oscillating coil, represents one possibility as to a capacitor of more complex form, and this is what we're getting into here, because we're all this all going to lead up to Tesla. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, the perception of capacitance as used today is wholly inadequate for the proper understanding of this effect. Steinmetz mentions in his 
introductory book, Electric Discharges, Waves, and Impulses, to quote, and we've already gone through this about the electric charge, so let's keep going. <coughs> okay, we'll keep going. All the lines of magnetic force are closed upon themselves.